Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about appifying your websites. Um, don't know how many of you guys have mobile websites. Don't know how many of you have got apps. Um, but it's something that we're all starting to think about. Um, just a brief introduction. My name's Richard. I'm a freelancer. I'm working at BBC Sport. I've um, been doing PHP for 12 years. Lived in Japan for 15 years. And I found the Cake PHP community uh, through living in Japan. And I found them in Tokyo. And awesome community. Really glad to be a part of it. Um, so, one way of making uh, apps is by using Cordova, which is the open sourced uh, name for um, PhoneGap. Uh, Adobe PhoneGap released an open source fork which was taken on by Apache uh, Foundation. And um, it's just that. Apache Cordova is a platform for building native mobile applications using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And I think um, that's great for us because I think in all of our web apps, that's pretty much what we're doing. We're writing HTML, writing CSS, writing JavaScript. So how does Cordova or PhoneGap do this? Um, what is the platform that it sits on top of that makes this possible? Uh, and it's actually really, really trivial. It's really almost too trivial it's dumb. Um, but you've got a web view. And a web view is, you know, in, when you're using Twitter, a client in your phone, um, when you press a link, it doesn't go and open up your browser. It opens up the link within that app. And that is a web view. It's, um, and it's basically there to be used. Um, and what Cordova does is use that web view, and that becomes your app. So completely trivial. But we have a goal. We have a goal when we're trying to get our mobile websites or our websites onto a phone, and that's to make it feel appish. Everyone's got this kind of um, words that they use to describe appish or I want to make it feel native, and, and it's all meaningless words, really, but you, you want a seamless experience for your user um, and for them not just to say, oh, that's just a website and a phone. Um, so that is the goal. And there's three approaches to doing this. The first is to consume JSON feeds using Ajax. Um, you can use Cake for that. That's probably what people will be doing. The other way of doing it is to use iframe and inject content into the iframe in that web view. And the other way of doing it is to consume rendered pages. Um, so you actually render all of this stuff um, on the server and bring it in. So here's a case study. And this is the exciting part, because I worked on this project. And it was a very exciting project. And it was a, you're not going to use PhoneGap to do that, are you? Um, we basically pushed PhoneGap to the absolute limits of what it can handle. And some of these things that we did, I don't particularly recommend PhoneGap for. But the fact that you can do it means that PhoneGap is pretty flexible. And for us guys who are already using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, it provides a real uh, easy point of entry. Um, so the BBC Olympics app was the top free app on the iTunes store. It was also the editor's choice on the iTunes store. We had. Uh, 2,231,400 unique users. Um, we'd kind of hoped for more, but the app was pulled from international stores because um, NBC were, were bitchy and they made us pull it. So it was only available overseas for like three days, four days, and it got pulled. And a lot of the features we, we, had, we couldn't um, do internationally anyway because the 
Olympics Commission, this and that. Um, we had 15 million daily page views. Um, that, compared to the mobile website, was 18 million, uh, 8 million. There's 8 million on the mobile website, 15 million from the app. So I'll go on to explain how the app is similar to the mobile website, and it's, it, it, it just shows that there is a huge market for apps. People are wanting to go and use apps a lot more than what they are being able to um, navigate to a, web, a website. I'm not saying I agree with it, it's just how it is. I actually think we should just be doing mobile websites. And it is a pure JavaScript app. It has some native features, but it was pure JavaScript. And out of the comments that we got on the store, um, apart from the ones that were calling us baboons or some other offensive word, um, but none of the comments actually said, this isn't native. Not one person said, that's not a native app. So I think we did quite well, and it showed that um, PhoneGap was a good way of doing this. So what features did we have? So this is the um, mobile website, and it wraps that current mobile website in the wrapper app. We had offline reading, um, so that you could read it on the train, on the tube, when you're not having access to the internet. Had live video. Had live text commentary. We had uh, several native plugins for customizable menus and things like that. There's also multi-environment, overseas, UK, pre-games, post-games. And it had to have a full life cycle. So we had to think, OK, how are we going to start this app? And I think that's one thing that we don't think about when we're doing our projects, is we're not thinking about the whole life cycle of, of a, a project. We're usually thinking about, how do I get this thing going? But you don't actually think about, how am I going to kill this thing? And I think that's something that we, we even need to start taking on board for our web projects, because they get out of hand really quickly. And they go down this little path that you're not in any control of. And uh, one other challenge that we had was um, like for the JavaScript and CSS to self-update. Um, one of the challenges of chasing a live website is that when they make CSS changes, when they make JavaScript changes, it can completely kill your app. And, and the team that made the mobile website was not the mobile app team. Although we, we, we shared the same building, it was a completely different team, and I often had to go over and get really angry at them. So the PHP bit. Well, the PHP bit is actually really, really trivial. And it's really, really simple. Um, we had to use Zen Framework. Um, I'm not a big fan of that. Really sorry about that. And um, we decided to make it render the pages into the body property of a JSON object. So we re had rendered HTML in um, the JSON. And that actually worked quite well. And what we did is that we, we basically used XHR requests to pull that in into the JavaScript app. Um, we didn't use any um, JavaScript framework apart from underscore. Um, but it's totally doable with Backbone or Angular. It, and that would be a really, really good good way of building mobile apps really quickly. And it's a way that you can make your mobile apps probably the same as your, your websites. And everyone you know, fires up this big debate of, oh, it won't get accepted by the App Store and all the rest of it. Um, we called Apple, because the BBC can just call them and say, hey, what do you think? They went for a meeting, and they just said, sure, as long as it's got a bar at the top and a bar at the bottom that's different from the website, that's fine. And so um, we managed to get it in very easily. And this is the kind of folder structure they have. Um, they use this really weird templating BBC language called Spectrum that's really, really shit. Um, but it looks like a lot of your cake projects, I'm sure. So they had a mobile high 
and a Hope Mobile Low high resolution mobile site, a low mobile, re mobile resolution site, and a desktop site. And I'm sure probably many of you use the desktop site. And the desktop site, by the way, got like 150 million page views a day. So that's quite big. And this is how we did it um, on the spectrum side, on the uh, views. Um, so we just got an output buffer and, and shoved that in the JSON, really simple. Of course, if you had done this in Cake, all you would have needed to do was put that in the controller and that in a JSON CTP file. And that's all you would have needed to have done on the PHP side to do what we had to do. Um, so really simple. So testing. Some of the things that's um, really good about making apps like this is that you can run this through a browser. What we did is we just fired up MAMP, put that on port 8080, and had a, a proxy request that went to go and get the, the requests from the server and pull that local. And apart from that, it was just a web app. It was a web app that we we could integrate very cleverly with the, with the native plugins. And so we just fired it up in the browser and did all of our testing through there. Um, we used uh, regular JavaScript testing tools. Uh, we didn't use um, Jasmine, but we used um, J, uh, uh, is it JRunner or something like that? But um, also the, the tests were really, really fast. So if anyone tells you that JavaScript's slow, it's bullshit. It's really fast. We, we um, ran like 110 tests with something like 700 assertions in a, a second. Um, but that's partly because like, browsers have, have heavily optimized how JavaScript runs. But there's a whole ton of gotchas. There's a whole time, a lot of times when it just isn't workable and you feel, ah, oh, we're not going to get there. And we did have to step in with some features that needed to be done natively. Um, one of the things that we had was, um, well, I'll explain that on the next slide. Um, probably only English people get that. You might have seen that anyway. But we, there's huge handset inconsistency. And what we were doing was <laughs> we had parts of our site that had to use an iframe and inject content into that because it came from a third-party service. But that third-party service had a lot of JavaScript in it. Now, if you're trying to run JavaScript inside an iframe, it's normally OK on iOS. And actually, iOS was pretty much fine for anything that we threw at it. So I. After my experience with this, I'm very loath to get an Android device because I know iPhone is a lot easier to develop for. It's more predictable. Um, what we had with Android is that um, two or three versions would handle the iframe JavaScript, embedded JavaScript, but the later versions of Ice Cream Sandwich and Jelly Bean didn't support it, or they didn't support it properly, and it was doing weird stuff that we just couldn't control. And so in the end, the only way that you can do that is get a, a um, native developer to do it for you. But I, I don't think you'd have those requirements, to be honest. And that's why I think that PhoneGap is still a really, really good way of, of getting websites up and running very quickly. So you really need to choose what sort of app is it going to be. Because in some cases, you might need to go native. And I think as your, your app gets more difficult and more complex, the, 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 the more need that you're going to have to eventually go native. But I think if you stay like quite agile and make your apps simple and then just build on that incrementally, you'll be fine in probably 90% of the time. The other issues you have is cross-domain issues when, when getting everything by XHR. Um, there are lots of ways around this. Um, we made a HTTP proxy plugin, but you don't need to. The other thing that was probably the biggest challenge is where does the JavaScript live? Does the JavaScript live on the web, on the web view on the phone, or does it live on the website? 
and we had we basically chose to make it live on the phone, which was our choice. So um, document location ends up being file dot slash slash something something, which is fine. But when you're hosting videos and things like that, there were parts of the BBC infrastructure that just didn't support that. So we had to kind of creatively work around that. Um, Document ready, everything needs to be wrapped in device ready. Um, we realized about three or four days in um, this and we're thinking why doesn't stuff work and we wasted time on that. But if you read, that's why you need to read the docs before you actually go and start coding. Where we, we, we just thought we were great and went ahead and did it anyway. So what else does PhoneGap offer you? Um, if it's just a dumb web view, I mean, you can make your own web view. You can make your own phone gap. Why do you need phone gap at all? Well, the reason is, is because it offers you this API to be able to get hold of most of the things that you need to on the phone. Um, I don't think like the accelerometer and things like that and the compass will be quite as responsive as native, but I think on most apps, it won't matter. Unless you're making like a 3D game that's you're driving a car or something like that. But for, for the majority of the projects that we're doing, it will completely be fine. So you've got the accelerometer, camera capture, um, that's for media files and stuff. You can get the contacts. You can work out the connection stuff. Um, we used quite an old version of phone gap because we didn't want the new stuff to break, but actually there was some bugs on one or two handsets when it told the phone that it was offline when it wasn't. So that was quite annoying, but I'm sure they fixed that by now. Um, compass, device, uh, events. The file uh, mapping system is particularly good for file storing stuff online uh, on your phone, and it was very, very quick. It was extremely quick. And like I said, no one noticed that this was JavaScript. Um, so just at the events example, um, you've got like device ready, you've got pause, resume. So you can basically find out what's going on in your phone. You can find out where the app is. Um, like when you bring it to the foreground, we had lots of actions when you brought it to the foreground. We, BBC are really into stats and tracking everything and we had to have UK stats and we had to have international stats because the international guys didn't trust the stats that we were giving them because they were basically making money off of advertising. So there's a lot of other non-native apps about. Um, quite a lot actually. So the Financial Times, they use PhoneGap. I've got friends that work there actually. Uh, Wikipedia, it's a bit of a shit one, actually, but they use the iframe technique. Um, so we called uh, Adobe and talked to them about all of the different techniques we could try. Um, and they, they suggested that, that iframe was a way, but wasn't the best way. Um, LinkedIn, I don't know if it's phone gap or not, but it is 95% HTML5. Um, again, it's hard to tell that this is not a native app. There's a lot of lies going about. Um, I, I think that politicians are liars, but um, the Facebook app was quite slow and shit. And basically, they, they have a fork of phone gap that they run it on, and the argument was but these phone gap apps are shit because Facebook is shit. Um, they've just released a, a native version of their app um, because it was shit. Um, but I don't think it was the native or not. I think it was probably how it was built. And again, the complexity thing. If you get really high complexity, you're starting to outgrow what the app can do. So what about uh, Accelerate uh, Titanium? Accelerator. Um, someone asked me this over lunch. Uh, has anyone used Accelerator before? Okay. 
Okay, I'm not going to... Um, for us, we felt it wasn't for us. One of the things that we don't like is that it creates code that you can't look into and you can't see. It's a lot harder to debug. You, you can't see where all the memory is going, where you can JavaScript's JavaScript. And so it's a lot easier to, f to follow and maintain with, with regular, normal JavaScript techniques where f Titanium actually converts some of your stuff into native code and then you can't end up seeing what's inside it. So it's a fairly short presentation, but um, I didn't want to bore you. You've probably got a lot of listening to do today, but um, questions? To migrate. Mm -hmm. Yep. Actually, there's been a lot of stuff on. So the question was, um, uh, is it easy to migrate from a phone gap app to a regular uh, native app and back? Um, there's there's been a lot of talk on the internet about this of doing partially native apps, and that being a good way of working forward. So what you because it's just a web view you can actually publish your content in your own web view in your app. So you could use part of what you've previously made and continue using it in the web view, which you can very seamlessly join together without realizing it, that it's going to a web view. Right, I know Mozilla have got a lot of stuff in JavaScript. I've got a few friends that live there. So yeah, there's times that should your app outgrow itself on the complexity level, then it would be totally a good way of, 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 of scaling it by moving part of your app to its own web view and, and making the rest of the app native. But app development is very expensive, so. Uh, this is not a question, more a comment. There's a, um, last year on JS Pong for GT, there was a talk called how to take HTML5 slash JS mobile apps and look, make them look more native on the iOS. Um, they had a lot of like, very small tricks on HTML5 mm -hmm. and JS mm -hmm. that made a whole difference because when you, uh, um, what this guy was showing that when you were like swipe, sweeping or whatever doing this like crap stuff, uh, it didn't work exactly right and with these few fixes that he was doing, they made it look almost completely native. So. Okay. Just wanted to mention it. Just yeah, yeah, Max it sounds true. Max Ogden. Ogden yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, we actually had a native developer, so when we wanted to make it look more native, we just told the native guy to do it. But yeah, Max Ogden. Okay. Any more for any more? Okay, thank you. <laughs>